going to keep thinking a little bit about citizenship and feeling in and out and so forth as we consider uh, this first reading at this service for today uh, from Philippians chapter 3. Let me read to you again the last few verses. Our citizenship is in heaven and it is from there that we are expecting a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, speak to us through your word. Strengthen our faith and our trust and help us to understand who we are and whose we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, when I first arrived in Australia to live here, um, a bit over 50 years ago, a bit over 51 years ago to be quite precise, uh, I was the citizen of another country. You can also see that I once was young. <laughs> Um, I was a citizen of Denmark, but I became a resident here in Australia. I had legal responsibilities to both countries, but ultimately I was Danish. Uh, Australia could kick me out. They still can, in fact, so I'm relying on your discretion. <laughs> but Australia could kick me out, but Denmark had to take me because that was my birthright, you see. I was born there. I belonged there. I might have been resident here, but I was a citizen of Denmark. And in a similar way, what Paul says to us here in our text is that we're resident in the world, but we're citizens in heaven. In other words, the world can reject us, can even kill us, but heaven has to take us, right? We belong to heaven because Whatever happens in this world doesn't impact our heavenly citizenship. It's our birthright because of our new birth in baptism. And when we're born into this world, we get a temporary residency. Now, I don't know if you can see that uh, from where you're sitting, but uh, that's my visa to come to Australia. And um, what do you notice about it? Sorry I didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah, four years, right? <laughs> That's why I said I was relying on your discretion. Four years, it's got a terminus to it. And that's interesting because our residency in this world also has an end to it, right? It's not forever. We don't know how long it's for, thank goodness. Right? We don't know when the end date is, but we do know that it's temporary and it will expire, our residency in this world, because our permanent residency is in heaven. And that shapes our lives, even as we live here temporarily. A little more about that in a minute, but first of all, let's just notice what Paul also says in our text, that behind our heavenly citizenship stands the power and work of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. From there, Jesus rules with all his power and glory. And when our temporary residency in this world ends, we will join him there where he also lives. Not only that, but this old weak body will be transformed into a new heavenly glorious body without all our present foibles and difficulties and so on. And so residents on earth, but citizens of heaven, and Paul in our text exhorts us to stand firm as citizens in heaven. I see that uh, Mike Flynn's not here this morning, is he? Mike, anywhere? No? So I can speak freely, right? <laughs> <laughs> it 
once again, I'm relying on your discretion. When we arrived in New Zealand in the late 1950s, there were some things that surprised us, much as Selena told us about how visiting overseas places at times can surprise us. Uh, we came from Europe uh, in that, not immediately after the Second World War, but still in that post-war period. Uh, and of course, we brought some of our culture and traditions with us, right? So everybody who's come from overseas can probably tell that story. Although we did know one Dane back then uh, who after about six months tried to convince us all he could no longer speak Danish. Uh, none of us believed him. And so we brought some things of our culture with, even though we began to do some things also in the Kiwi way fairly soon after we arrived. But one of the things that stuck with us even to this day is that we celebrated Christmas on Christmas Eve. Right? And we took turns to open presents so everyone saw what everyone else got. And in, in Kiwi land at the time, it was the Christmas morning scramble right? And all over and about three heartbeats <laughs> as paper got ripped and torn and so forth. And so we decided to keep that with. Uh, around Christmas there's one tradition we didn't bring with us uh, and that was that the men in the house, well we did first year, but the men in the house would decorate the Christmas tree on Christmas Eve and then only after that the kids would come and see it. And of course it was meant to be, wow! The other Christmas tradition we used the first year but didn't after that was that we had live candles on the Christmas tree. <laughs> uh, that works fairly well in Europe. <laughs> it sort of doesn't work so well uh, when you're using a, a, a fairly dry already pine tree. Um, and so there were some things we brought with and there were some things that were different. But we kind of lived in two worlds if you like. Uh, we lived in two different cultures. I also remember when I started school in New Zealand, right? Uh, because some things suddenly got, looked very different. I got to school and the other kids felt sorry for me because of my sandwiches for lunch, right? Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, right? But basically I had open sandwiches on dark bread um, and each one was different. Uh, whereas for Kiwi kids at the time, it was whatever filling mum was using and that was in all the sandwiches. So they felt sorry for me because of my lunch and I felt sorry for them because of their lunch. Right? Again, there were some things that were different. We shared many things with others, but in some respects we followed a different drummer. Our customs and food probably are more like locals now. Mind you, in a place, multicultural place like Australia, it's a bit hard to know what Australian food is, right? A wonderful land, line in a British, in, in a British com comedy where one character says to the other, let's go out and have some real British food. Shall we have curry or pizza? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so they felt sorry for me and I felt sorry for them. So let's explore for a bit this idea of following a different drummer, living in one context but also being shaped in part by another. And I want to take you back to about 150 AD. Uh, in the middle of the second century, someone who calls himself Matthias, but that just means disciple, writes a letter to somebody he called Diognetes. And that letter has survived. And in that letter, he's trying to explain to his pagan neighbours why these Christians are different. Right? And summarise how that difference is. And, and um, I want to quote to you a bit of that. You can just Google it and you'll find the whole thing. Uh, letter to Diognetes. But let me just... Um, read to you a section uh, of that letter. Um, I apologise for the lack of uh, inclusive language, but that was not a priority in the year 150. 
and I will try to update it a bit as we go along. So here we go. For Christians are not distinguished from the rest of humankind, either in locality or in speech or in customs. For they dwell not somewhere in cities of their own, neither do they use some different language nor practice an extraordinary kind of life. <clears throat> nor again do they possess any invention discovered by any intelligence or study of ingenious people nor are they masters of any human dogma, as some are. But while they dwell in cities of Greeks and barbarians, as the lot of each is cast, and follow the native customs and dress and food and the other arrangements of life, yet the constitution of their own citizenship, which they set forth, is marvellous and confessedly contradicts expectation. They dwell in their own countries, but only as sojourners. They bear their share in all things as citizens, and they endure all hardships as strangers. Every foreign country is a fatherland to them, and every fatherland is foreign. They marry like all other people and have children, but they do not cast away their offspring. They have meals in common but not their spouses. Hmm? They find themselves in the flesh, and yet they live not after the flesh. Their existence is on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws, and they surpass the laws in their own lives. They love all people, and they are persecuted by all. They are ignored, and yet they are condemned. They are put to death, and yet they are endued with life. They are in beggary, and yet they make many rich. They are in want of all things, and yet they abound in all things. They are dishonoured, and yet they are glorified in their dishonour. They are evil spoken of, and yet they are vindicated. They are reviled, and they bless. They are insulted, and they respect. Doing good, they are punished as evildoers. Being punished, they rejoice as if they were thereby quickened by life. War is waged against them as aliens by the Jews, and persecution is carried on against them by the Greeks. And yet those that hate them cannot tell the reason of their hostility. What do you reckon? Interesting, isn't it? And in, in, in many respects, is as modern as the 21st century, uh, apart from the language, of course. He's describing Christians in his society. But I think it's a remarkable description of what it means to be in the world, but not of it, if you like. Um, Christians, he says, will share good and evil with other people in the community while following a different leader with different values and priorities. The question is, how do we do that? How do we actually live that life? How do we live like that uh, as in the world but not of it when what we see so often is sadly not the case, and I mean that both as we look around us and also as we look in the mirror. Right? Sadly, it's not the case. So what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, this is the cover of a book. Um, I've taken off the name of the author, which didn't mean anything to me anyway. Um, so this is one Christian's take on what it means to be a disciple, the seven laws of discipleship, the ultimate guide, oh, blimey, the ultimate guide for spiritual transformation. Now, what's wrong with that picture? What do those steps say to you when you look at the picture? They aren't worth getting there, yeah. But they kind of also suggest, don't they, 
And that kind of, this is how we get closer to God. We obey these seven laws. And then step by step, we'll kind of get closer to God somehow. In fact, it seems that we need to do this in order to be spiritually transformed. Now, I don't know what <coughs> this author's seven laws of discipleship are, but like most lists like that, it probably includes many good things like praying every day, reading the Bible every day, witnessing to Jesus, caring and supporting others and so forth. Right? They're good things, not things that are wrong, not things that are inappropriate for Christians. So what's the problem? The problem is once they become laws that we somehow need to obey in order to be blessed. In the end, this picture tells us, does it not, that it's down to us and we need our best efforts in order to succeed. I've been a pastor for more than 40 years. And as I look back on the many thousands of people I've spoken with over that time, the situations that distress me most are when I've spoken with somebody who's been a Christian and been in church all their lives and their primary identity or self-identity is that they are miserable, rotten sinners. Right? Their primary self-identity is that they don't do anything right. Uh, God must be frowning on them constantly because they're such terrible failures uh, in all they do. Never measure up, never good enough. Of course, that's true, isn't it? The problem is not with that. The problem is when that becomes our primary identity. The problem when, is when that becomes how we see ourselves and therefore how we present ourselves to the world uh, and to others. Because this is no longer our primary identity if we're citizens of heaven. Right? This is no longer our primary identity if we're citizens of heaven. Sadly, an unscriptural teaching has crept into much of the evangelical church, including many who think they are also proper Lutherans. Of course the law of God convicts us of our sin, even when we're Christians. And then the gospel speaks and tells us that we're forgiven for Jesus' sake. But then some Christians emphasize that the law now has another use as a guide for Christian living. And again, there's some truth in that. You know, if you don't know the difference between right and wrong as a Christian, if you don't know what God's will is and what God's will is not, well then the law in the Bible can help you with that. No problem with that. The problem is that it's a small step from there to kind of trying to use the law of God as a motivator or as a whip to make us do better as Christians. The small step from saying, yes, the law still has something to teach us if we don't know it yet, but for the most part we actually do, but then to come to the point of saying, yeah, and you know, obeying that law that's how we really please God. That's how we really get into God's good books. That's how we secure for ourselves God's blessing on our lives. And yet St. Paul again and again emphasizes that we're free, emphasizes, I'm sorry, that we're free from the law. We're no longer under that law. We've been set free. You might like to read again Romans 5 to 8 or Galatians 3 to 4 and see how definite and how firm Paul is in saying we no longer live under that law. That's another way of saying that's not where our citizenship is. Our citizenship is in heaven. And our primary identity is 
as the citizens of heaven, not as the residents in this world where we fail and struggle so much. The law, gospel, law thing just doesn't work. It leads to despair or to pride. It leads to despair because we see we just can't do it. Just when we think we got it done, then all of a sudden we discover something else about ourselves. We do good stuff and we think, hey, that's good, I helped somebody, I donated to charity or whatever. And then God opens our eyes and we see we're so proud of it. <laughs> right? We so much think that that's, hey, look at me, how good I am, kind of thing. Or it leads to pride. That's a bit more, well, I don't know if it's subtle, but sometimes, you know, because the standard is so impossible. Jesus said, after all, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Who can do that? So it sort of becomes try your best. <laughs> right? We alter the standard a bit and then we can feel good about ourselves because uh, we've met that altered standard. Unfortunately, that's not God's standard. So if the flow of our lives in scripture is not law that condemns us, gospel that forgives us, and then law again that we should try to fulfill and keep, what is the flow of scripture in terms of discipleship? I said earlier that this was an unbiblical teaching that has crept in, or unscriptural teaching that has crept in to much of the evangelical church that says they believe the Bible. I believe the message of the Bible is law, gospel, and then Holy Spirit. Law, gospel, and then Holy Spirit. That's the flow. The church is not about good people getting better. The church is about bad people living, learning to live with their badness, <laughs> learning to live with their failure and their sin. Using the law as a motivator, right, as a stick to beat ourselves with, really just leads us to continuing the addiction we have to ourselves. Because basically it says it's all up to you. And for me, that's a problem, right? Ruth will tell you, she's not here this morning because she carelessly became a close, what's the word? A close contact of uh, somebody um, who then was diagnosed with COVID. Uh, I didn't. And being close to a close contact doesn't make you a close contact, apparently, currently. Hard to keep up with all that. I digress. But I won't shake your hand today anyway for that reason. Using that law in that way feeds our addiction to ourselves because it says it's all up to you and you can do it if you only try hard enough. You can do it if only you sacrifice more, if only you pray more, if only you read the Bible more. Uh, if only you dedicate yourself again and again to pull yourself up by your own shoelaces. It just doesn't work. We just can't do it. It focuses us in the wrong place. It focuses us on ourselves. When the Father and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit might work in our lives and make us more like Jesus. Again, while that's happening, we ain't going to be particularly aware of it. In fact, if we are, it's a bit of a problem because that leads to pride, which is a bit of a problem. So we may be becoming more con conscious as we grow in our Christian walk that we, that we do sin, that we do fail, that we need the grace of God. But our identity is in heaven. Our identity is as the forgiven children of God. We humbly acknowledge we're far from perfect, but we live as citizens of heaven because that's who we are. And so St. Paul in our text exhorts us to stand firm on that identity of who we are. Whatever else we may do, whatever else may happen to us, that is our birthright in baptism. It's who we are. It's our identity that doesn't change. It's our identity that says, even though 
we'll never be good enough to please God, even though no matter how hard we try to motivate ourselves to do better, we won't succeed. We will remain sinners. But praise be to God, because Jesus died in our place, therefore we're forgiven, and therefore we're set free from our guilt and our shame, because we're citizens of heaven. And so stand firm on what Jesus has done for you. Don't believe the illusion that somehow you can make yourself better until you become good enough. But just let the Holy Spirit do his work in you as you dwell in the word, as you come to the table, uh, and stand firm in the promises of God because you are citizens of heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your blessing in what you've made us and who we are. And thank you, Lord, that nothing that happens in this world can change the fact that we are your children, your forgiven children, and citizens of your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, who did this for us. Amen.